hit some uh, brief remarks uh, at the beginning, so everyone know we were uh, going to get started. So I will turn it over to you. Since thanks, good guys. Time. Very good. Well, thanks, Jim. And uh, let me thank each of you for agreeing to serve on this critically important task force and for being here this morning. <clears throat> I'm especially uh, appreciative of our co-chairs, Jim Dyke and Eva Teague uh, Hardy, for agreeing to take on this assignment. And I know that Eva has prior commitments this month, but she'll participate by phone uh, when she can and then participate in April <clears throat> after that. Uh, we're here today to focus on the schools. And I'm not going to repeat anything that I said last week when I created the task force, but I do want to focus on some highlights, and maybe I will repeat one or two things that I said last week. Uh, too often in the budgeting process, we tend to focus our time and attention on city services, and we tend to treat the school system as a grantee, funding them with little review. Uh, this year, we've been presented with a $24 million gap, and I don't believe that uh, any member of council or myself believes that we can fund an additional $24 million. Uh, it would uh, translate into a 12 cents hike in our real estate uh, tax, and I don't think that this is the time to entertain that. Uh, but we're motivated to focus on the schools for two main reasons. First and foremost, the education of our children is the most important service we provide, and we've got to provide it in an excellent way. And secondly, being purely pragmatic, the school's operating budget is the largest <coughs> ongoing appro appropriation for any single agency in our budget. And so it's important for us to start from the premise that we're willing to <coughs> spend what we need to get excellent results with educational improvements. Uh, and that depends largely on what happens at the General Assembly uh, which adjourned on yesterday, but will return for a special session on March 21st to discuss the budget. Uh, the long-term plan is to develop strategies and initiatives that will inform us about where and how we can invest the dollars that we have for education. We want to generate the maximum return on our investment in public education. Just as we view our bricks and mortar economic development strategies, any investment about where and how we can invest in our education has got to produce uh, a return. Uh, making the tough decisions now to ensure that when a student graduates from Richmond Public Schools, he or she will have options, but whatever options they choose, they'll be prepared for success in a global market. Uh, I don't think anybody in this room or around this table, Jim has the silver bullet uh, to find a solution to this uh, dilemma. Uh, but we're here today with the formation of this task force to dedicate our energies collectively, and I want to uh, dedicate my energies and the resources of myself and my administration and the city to building an education system that is nothing short of excellence. So with that, Jim, <coughs> we are grateful to all of you for your participation, and we know that you're going to uh, provide us with uh, some good information and a good result. Doing the uh, initial short-term period, we want to talk about ways to address the uh, budget shortfall, and then on the long term, we want to talk about ways that we can look at education as a whole. Uh, by the presence of the superintendent and some super, uh, some members of the school board, uh, we're believing that we have the full cooperation of the school system in terms of making sure that we have the uh, data that we need in order to uh, move forward with with our deliberations. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, okay. you. and say go to work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. We certainly appreciate your uh, asking us to step up to do this, and uh, it, it's a great honor for us to have this opportunity to, to work with you and with the uh, Richmond School System and with its leadership. Uh, as you indicated, there's nothing more important uh, as far as the role of government than education, making sure that our students are prepared for uh, the future and to compete in the global economy. So anything that we can do, uh, we're certainly going to uh, give it our all. Uh, I, I want to commend you for putting together such a, a stellar task force. And we're going to go around and have everybody introduce themselves. But let, me <coughs> let you know that uh, you couldn't have picked a, a better co-chair for me than uh, Eva Hardy. Eva and I have worked together on a number of projects over the years. 
and we've already had dialogue several times prior to this meeting, so she's going to be very much involved in this, and so uh, it will be a team effort. And uh, the fact that you have my former deputy, deputy secretary of education as your chief of staff <laughs> also uh, is, is comforting for me. Uh, but we will make the tough decisions. You've got some people around this room who've got ex have experience in both the public and private sector. We've had to make tough decisions, and we realize that uh, sometimes these are, are you're going to have to make really tough decisions when you're talking about trying to deal with a $24 million uh, shortfall. But we also recognize that it needs to be done in a cooperative fashion, and the fact that we have the superintendent and the school board and the council uh, and the mayor here at the table, I think, is a good indication that everybody has a common goal. And hopefully we'll be able to give you some specific recommendations in the short term to address the $24 million issue and then a longer term uh, suggestion just to how we can have a more efficient uh, school system. So, well, thank, thank you, you so much, Jim. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to stick for just a minute. <coughs> oh, okay. And then Very I'll, good. And then I'll, I'll leave. All right. Uh, well, what I'd like to do initially first is welcome everyone here, members of the task force. Thank you for uh, volunteering to, uh, to participate in this. Uh, I think what I'd like to do is start off by going around the room and having members of the task force introduce themselves so we know who's sitting here. We'll start off with the distinguished head of the city council. Kathy Graziano, city council. Good to have you here. President. Right. Good morning. I'm Brenda True. I'm a retired principal. I was principal at Open High School for many wonderful years. I'm glad to be here. Glad to be here. My name is Angela Hughes. I'm president of the Richmond Education Association. And as president, I represent all employees that work for all people, all my members are people who work for Richmond Public Schools, teachers, custodians, um, food service, I'm David Hanks, the mayor's chief of staff. Suzette Denslaw, I'm the mayor's chief of staff. My name again is Jim Dyke. I'm a partner with Woods and former secretary of education for Commonwealth. Jack Berry, executive director of Venture Richmond in a previous life many years ago with the city budget director and a deputy city manager for finance and administration. My name is Peter Blake. I'm the director of the state council of higher education here in Richmond. A uh, longtime city resident, three children who came to Richmond Public Schools, and Brenda and I also serve on the City of Richmond Library Board. Another former Secretary of Education. Harris <laughs> Johnson, Division President of Premier Bank Inc., and avid volunteer for Richmond Public Schools. Good morning, BK Fulton, Vice President for the Mid Atlantic Region for the Latin Community. I'm Ron Tillett, and uh, Managing Director and Public Finance at Morgan Keegan, investment banking firm. Uh, I also serve as the uh, uh, the chair of the Richmond Retirement System, so I, I deal with a lot of the uh, a lot of the employees of the, of the city, uh, as well as uh, employees of the school system. Uh, formerly Secretary of Finance uh, and State Treasurer for the Commonwealth. I serve with Jim and Suzette, and Peter, and <laughs> all other folks around the room, and, and the mayor. Yeah. Now, uh, let me just outline what we hope to address today. Uh, we're first going to have a presentation on the school budget, uh, which will be, uh, I understand, uh, done by the chair of the school board and the vice chair, and the superintendent and her staff will be available as well. Uh, we'll then get an overview from Suzette of some of the previous studies that have been done, I more specifically the 2004 efficiency study that the Commonwealth did on the school system to try to identify some of the things that could be done uh, to save money, uh, with one of our charges being to see whether or not those efficiencies have, in fact, been implemented, and do they present an opportunity for us to help address the, uh, the budget issue. Uh, we will then have some general discussion among the task force just to kind of get your ideas and thoughts on where you see us going, and also discuss our uh, schedule going forward. <coughs> Uh, as you read in the charge, uh, we, we really have two objectives. One is the short-term recommendations as it relates to the budget, which is going to have to be done fairly quickly because uh, generally uh, the city has to have its budget, I believe, by May 15th, somewhere in that half, or uh, within a certain time period after the Commonwealth adopts a budget. Now, that's assuming normal course of business and we'll be in the middle of May. Uh, given what's going on at the General Assembly, this could be a, a longer period. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, but 
for our purposes, we're going to be moving fairly quickly to try to address that issue and then also putting in place the structure for us to address on a longer term basis, looking at the school system, its <coughs> efficiencies, how we can work with, this, with the city, how we can share services if, if necessary, and, and where we can get some savings there. So that's our long term objective. But to address the first one, uh, let us start by hearing a presentation on the proposed school budget as, uh, as it now sits before the city. Uh, the chair of the school board, Don Page, uh, will present, and uh, Mr. Henderson, you will yes. also participate in the presentation. I understand there's a third member of the school board who may have arrived. Okay, if you could identify yourself. Kim Kimberly Bridges. Terrific. Thanks for having me being here. We appreciate it. So I will turn it over to you, Madam Chair, to okay. tell us what the budget looks like. All right, well, before we start with the budget presentation, um, I just want to say welcome, good morning, and welcome. And thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity to work with the Richmond Public Schools. We are excited to see what shared solutions that will come out of this um, you know, come from this task task force as it relates, you know, recommendations. And also know that the Richmond Public School Board, um, we will cooperate because, again, we welcome this opportunity because what we do will ultimately have an impact on our children. And we want our children to reap all the benefits that are, that are available to them. Also, um, I would give you an overview of the contents of your packet that was delivered to you hopefully over the weekend and Mr. Henderson, our vice chair, will have a presentation. But before um, we, you know, we start with that, I have just want to say a few things um, on behalf of the school board. Again, I want to say that you know we welcome this opportunity to assist us in finding additional savings, but not on the backs of our children or the workforce of Richmond Public Schools. We want to cooperate, and we will fully cooperate. This board has fulfilled its fiduciary responsibility with the utmost efficiency and accountability to improve to approve a budget that is an estimate of the amount of money needed during the upcoming fiscal year for the support of our students in the district. We have made over $50 million in reductions in the past five years while protecting the classrooms as much as we could. In January, we had a series of budget work sessions prioritizing the proposed <coughs> superintendent recommended cuts on top of cuts over the last five years. We met with each city council member to give them an overview of our budget and also we met with the mayor. To put all of this in perspective, the VA president has indicated the state obligations would have been $1.6 billion higher if the General Assembly had not taken steps <coughs> excuse me, since 2008 to lower Virginia's education standards. On February 16th, the RPS board approved the superintendent's funding year 2013 budget plus additional $23.8 million. The board refused to accept the recommended cuts. The $23.8 million consisted of cuts that we knew that we were going to face, we were going to be facing. Our responsibility is to provide an effective school system for our young people. This board knows what is needed to be successful, students to be career <coughs> and or college ready, and students to be prepared in a globally society and to be able to be competitive. 
This board realized that the district might not get the added re revenue it requested from the city, but this was the starting point of negotiating and how to create solutions. Being at the table to create shared solutions. We decided that this would be a disservice to the students and to the district's work workforce that provide the necessary educational learning, the support needed to assist our students to become productive citizens. We would not have done our job if this board had submitted a budget asking for less than is needed to operate the system. We have continuously cut compared to the surrounding localities, and we will never be able to allow our students to reach the fullest potential in a global competitive society. The goal of this school board is to take this district to the next level. And believe me when I say that. We have a mandate from the district's first strategic planning that was community driven, a roadmap focusing on instructional improvement, operational efficiencies, a system wide with system wide innovations. Again, this board has embraced accountability, transparency, and efficiencies over the last four years. And again, we want to thank you. Now I'm going to go over the contents that were delivered to you in your packet. You have a copy of the original funding year 2013 budget. And you have a copy of the approved funding year 2013 budget. You have document the CAFA, which is a comprehensive annual finan financial report. And also, you should have a copy of monthly financial statement. And a document with the per people spending factors that has impacted the per people funding for the district. So those are the documents that we have included in your packet. Also, before Mr. Henderson gets started, we want you to know that your point of contact for the task force will be Mr. Henderson, the vice chair from the board, and Ms. Angela Anderson, she, would, she will be the point of contact from the administration. We will provide their contact information at the end of this meeting, so they will be available to assist you with any questions that you may have um, as we go through this process. And now I will turn it over to Mr. Henderson, the Vice Chair. Good morning. Thank Good morning. you very much for uh, investing your time with our students, uh, the City of Richmond. Uh, we think this is a valuable function that uh, we're all performing, so we really do appreciate your being here. Um, this morning, uh, we're here because uh, we all agree that the children of Richmond are performing um, in a new and different world. Uh, if I go back to uh, my childhood, uh, we were in the path of the Richmond uh, Expressway. At the same time, I was caddying for the uh, golfers of the Richmond of the Virginia Country Club. And so I had an opportunity to see both worlds of Richmond all my life. As a senior in high school, 
um, I was uh, the senior class president the year that Maggie Walker was integrated. We had a fantastic year as a community. I had an opportunity to present to the Virginia Professional Engineering Society. And what I want to leave from that is that Richmond Public Schools prepared me and Mrs. Page to be very significant and contributing citizens. And I believe that today, that Richmond Public Schools likewise is preparing young people to do that. And I work with young folks every day who are seeking an opportunity to attend college and are prepared to enter colleges and universities. And I think if you take the time, and we invite you to visit our schools and get to know some of our students, that you will find much of the same thing. We are a population of 24,000 <coughs> students from pre-K, and we think our pre-K program is vital to what we do in the Richmond Public Schools. Uh, it allows us to give children not only a head start, but a jump start on life to overcome some of the things that, that, that may not have been provided uh, in the early years of their life, all the way through, um, through uh, 12th grade. We are a city that is uh, noted as having one fourth of its population living in poverty and a significantly larger percentage living near uh, poverty. And so we have a population that we respond to very effectively and meet them every morning at the door at their, at their point of need. Uh, we also have a special education population that's roughly 20%, which is the largest in the region. And I am particularly proud of the way that our staff and professionals meet the needs of these families uh, and the students uh, to help address their particular needs and give them a chance at life as a normal uh, and contributing citizen. Our, uh, our staff is uh, roughly 4,000 people, uh, and if you'll see the, as you'll see as we dig through the data, uh, an increasingly <coughs> large share of our staff has been committed to the classroom to face the challenges uh, that uh, our student population uh, presents to us. It's uh, worth note that as we have done this work, that we have shifted to <coughs> the point where we are the lowest in the region in terms of percent of our staff and resources allocated to administration. State average, I believe is 2.8%, uh, uh, we're at 2%. And we continue to drive for efficiency in that area. Our general fund, which is the reason that we're here, because money really does matter. What we do about the budget determines whether all of those priorities that we talk about are able to be accomplished. It is simply that uh, we're an open book. Uh, we've delivered to you, down to operation code, uh, the way that we spend the taxpayers' money. And we stand ready, uh, Ms. Anderson and I, to be the first line to answer your questions, uh, to provide you the additional data that you may want and need. Uh, again, we encourage you uh, to dig through in any way that you desire the information around the way that we run our school, the way that we're planning to uh, pursue things going forward uh, in our district. Uh, we want to make all of that information available to you with no hurry. Uh, not spending time on the past, uh, we find ourselves in a situation where we have a loss of about $10 million in revenue uh, and an increase in cost, principally employee benefits, uh, retirement, and other benefits that uh, increase our cost to service our employees of about $14 million. That shortfall is a discussion of today, $20.8 million. We've identified ways to cut that. <coughs> the administration has offered recommendations to us that have severe impact on the priorities that we believe are important to our children. And as a way of looking at those, uh, we considered through, through many, many hours uh, ways to try to get there. We know that the federal spigot uh, was wonderful to us. It allowed us during the uh, 2010, 2011, and 12 fiscal years uh, to avoid uh, layoffs and to retain critical staff that allowed us to meet the needs of our children. That's no longer available to us. 
The state of Virginia has not been able to step up to its obligation to fund education in the state of Virginia as it should. Every, every review and every look at that tells us that we need at the state level to be spending more money on education, but we are not. That leaves us with one person to call for help. And so we come to the city, our funding authority, our local funding authority, uh, to provide us the opportunity to continue the work that we are, are set about. And that is uh, to help us uh, close this gap. I want to leave you with this chart. Over the years, uh, the city of Richmond, the school board, and our communities have identified some really critical priorities. And every one of these priorities drives our budget in very significant ways. We believe that to serve our population well, we need a reduced class size. And there's fairly little literature, whether you go to the finest private school in the country. Uh, my daughter went to Phillips uh, Andover. Uh, size classes of 10 is normal. The opportunity to interact uh, very intimately with your instructors and teachers is a critical aspect of making sure that you get it, that you get it all along the way and that you brought along if you are a little behind. Being able to provide neighborhood schools is a very important decision that was made many years ago here in Richmond to provide schools in our communities and not, not just efficient large factories that uh, do the agricultural education uh, model. To be able to compete in the employment of professionals who are outstanding professionals that we have uh, in our midst, the, uh, the Virginia Teacher of the Year. And we don't do that because we pay her more. She does not come here because of that. She comes here because she knows that she takes challenging kids like me and turns them into promising citizens. We believe that our specialty education, uh, our specialty education schools uh, are providing a, a, a wonderful place. Uh, they are all Blue Ribbon schools and award winners, and they have been visited recently by the Secretary of Education and other dignitaries. But our schools provide an opportunity for the most excellent uh, of our academic achievers uh, to excel uh, beyond the norm. We provide uniquely in this neighborhood, in this region, primary foreign language for every child. So every one of our children is understanding that there's a world beyond Richmond, beyond Virginia, beyond the United States, and that we must communicate and interact with the entire world culture. I personally believe that we are the largest anti-poverty program initiative in the city of Richmond. We meet our customer every day at the door, and I would guarantee you that from 8 to 3 in the afternoon, it is probably the best part of most of our children's day. Our people do that very well. They are very proud of what they do, and they're committed to it. We provide transportation facilities for our students so that they can have an opportunity to interact uh, with students all across the city. And that transportation vehicle is vital to us. We provide a preschool education, as I said earlier, that allows us to reach and serve kids who did not get a jump start on life. They may have started a little late, but we put them in a place where they are really ready to go. We have plans afoot that are supported by our budget to reach the most challenging phase of kids' lives. When you're 13, life is hell. You're confused about who you are and what you are and where you're going and what you're doing. And middle school reflects all of that. And so we have a program that we want to extend across all of our middle schools to serve our children in the most effective way. We have elementary school models that are on the table and ready to go. And we look forward to deploying those so that our children can, can perform in ways that they have not today. That we can introduce an international baccalaureate at the primary level, as well as provide other ex exciting and innovative steps for our students to get a jump start on science and technology. We look forward to extending the day. We are disappointed that the legislature did not uh, take this action and give us the flexibility to make this choice. But we fully intend, as many other districts have, to ask for a waiver so that we can extend our day and extend our calendar to serve our children. There is no mystery about the summer slide. It happens to every kid, not just the poorest kids, but every kid 
who sits and uh, plays video games all summer rather than reading and engaging themselves in intellectual activity. We believe that our community learning centers as we build our new schools will provide an opportunity for us to inter interact not only with the students, but their whole families. We believe that a healthy family makes for a positive student. It's that simple. And as we enable our families to be more effective at the things that they do, then we will be better able to educate their children. We have a technology roadmap that puts our schools on pace with all the schools in the state of Virginia. Technology is very costly. Making decisions about what technology we will deploy in our schools is a critical choice of how we spend the taxpayers' resources. It's important that we have that plan in place, and we do. It's important, and we will happily share with you our entire technology roadmap of how we want to do the things that we want to do and what we want to get to. We have a facility master plan that not only includes four new schools, but it, and we are thankful for those four schools, but it also includes plans to keep, maintain, and support hundred-year-old facilities that are some of the oldest in the state of Virginia and often, often in need of significant repair and maintenance. I believe as an athlete, as a, as a captain of my football team uh, at Maggie Walker, that uh, athletic participation is a key to reaching many of our students. It provides an opportunity for them to excel in ways that they might not otherwise, but it also sustains them as to why this whole thing called education is important, and that costs money. In, all, in order for us to participate at the Virginia High School League at the level that we desire, we need a full program which must be funded. In order for us to participate and engage in some of the things that are going on in the Virginia High School League, uh, we must be there in every sport, in every city and county that uh, our district is considered to be a part of. And so what I want to do is make sure that you hear us clearly. We stand ready to support you in your work. We look forward to all the opportunity, all the ideas. We do not have all the ideas of how to educate children and how to move the city forward. We look forward to working with you. We want to make sure that every number here is clear to you, that you understand what it means, you understand how we got it, and why we decided that that was the number for that place. And we want to make sure that any questions that you have get answered. And so again, I want to thank you for being here. Thank you for investing your time in our children and trying to help challenging kids like me to come to I want to wish you all the very best. Thank, thank you very much. I appreciate that presentation. Uh, and let me just say on behalf of the task force, I don't think there's anyone up here who disagrees with the mission and the objective that all of us want to have the best possible school system. And as we look at our long-term mission, we're going to be focusing on how we can help you accomplish those goals and, and have a structure in place to do that. Uh, but the first thing we need to face right now is the fact that we're talking about $24 million and whether or not uh, the reality of the situation is the city does not have unlimited funds, so we're going to have to make some tough decisions as to how much money is available and how that money is going to be used. And so in order for us to do that and to do our work here on the task force, I, I would like to go behind some of the things you raise and ask specific questions because uh, we do have in front of us uh, what was presented was a, I guess, a proposed way to address the $24 million by the superintendent uh, as to some particular or, or some possible reductions or changes. And I think a starting point for us would be to hear, uh, hopefully, from the superintendent as we walk through some of these, uh, the superintendent and the school board as we walk through some of these things, because I think we need to appreciate uh, what this means, what the impact of it is, uh, so we can weigh whether or not this is something we think uh, uh, is worthy of, of being supported or if we need to look for some alternatives. And in the material that was presented, you started off, uh, and I just assume run through these things, because I'm concerned about whether or not we're talking about real people or attrition or whatever. Right. Uh, Let's start off with the three-day furlough. Uh, can you talk in terms of what that means? Uh, does, that, uh, does that impact everybody less? Just, can you kind of walk us through what that means? The three-day furlough, oh, and good morning and thank you again. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, the three-day furlough represents the entire district, <coughs> everyone. Um, three days of um, 
time where uh, our teachers, our central administration, everyone would uh, not uh, receive a um, uh, payment for those days. And that would be um, determined, those three days would be, to, should it be a part of this discussion, would be determined uh, in uh, consultation and uh, agreement with the REA and other stakeholders. But yes, that means everyone. Uh, class size increases. What, what are we talking about? Uh, what, how, what would be the change? And also, I, you notice I have here, or you have here, 138 teaching positions. Does that mean uh, the class live bodies, or is it not filling positions? Uh, a mixture of both. We uh, did a survey of our uh, employment, our employees rather, and we found that at the point of the survey, there were 105 people who. Uh, indicated that they plan to either retire or to transition. Um, if we increase class sizes in the elementary level as well as uh, the middle and high school levels, that complement of teaching positions that you see is the sum total. Now, of the 105 that we, uh, that we received from our survey, that was a mixture across the board. It was not all teaching positions. Okay. Uh well, can you tell us how many work? Uh, I don't have that right now, but we can get that to you of the 105. So, if, all right, so the number you would give us would be the actual number of teachers, and then the difference between that and 138 would be the number of real people who would have to go in order to address the issue of class size. If it is a one to one match, yes, sir. But all too often, uh, things change between <coughs> now and the time for. Um, the final um, process with respect to retirement. But if it's one-to-one, -one, yes. And what would be the change in class size? Um, we're going to 24-to-1 on elementary school level, 22-to-1 on middle and high school levels. Right, and um, the whole uh, issue on the elementary level would be that um, we would not be able to exercise uh, the ability to use the K-3 reduction money. Okay, now how does that, the 24 to 1 on the, you said on the elementary side? 24 to 1 on the elementary side, 22 to 1 on the and secondary side. That would go to 24 from what? Uh, we're at, uh, with the schools that are uh, using the K-3 reduction dollars, we're at maximum 19 to 1. The lowest is 14. And on the 22, you went from what to 22? We're going from uh, 21 to 22 on the secondary level. What is K-3 reduction money? Uh, the K-3 reduction money is a state allocation that allows us to keep our kindergarten through third grade classes at a maximum of 19, a minimum of 14, and a maximum of 19 in order to promote the instructional uh, uh, process that is necessary for those students who are uh, at <coughs> risk. So uh, it supports the small classes in those areas. So if you go to 24 to 1, you lose that state money? Yes. How much is that enough? It's five million, about five million. Is that for all your schools or just specific uh, Most of our elementary schools. There are a few that are not a part of it, but most of our elementary schools. Only three of them, Fisher, um, Fox, Monkford, those three. Uh, yes. Oh, could you identify yourself? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. First Just of all, I record. apologize for being late. I'm Chris Hilbert. I'm a member of City Council and I'm the chair of the Council's Health, Human Services, and Education Committee. The, uh, the, the uh, criteria for getting this K through free money is being a five to one school. Free and reduced lunch percentages. Free and okay. mm -hmm. And anything mm -hmm. above 30, 40, 50? 30. 30. 30. Uh, 
um, Holton, and um, we may have one more, I believe, uh, Southampton, maybe one of them. Very close to it. And our charter school, Patrick Henry, uh, is below that 30% threshold at this point. Uh, what about instructional aids? We have here 80 regular preschool positions. Mm -hmm. um, are those, those actual bodies or what's the name, people are retiring or what? Uh, those, the 80 are actual bodies. The reduction based on the number of uh, people who actually retire will be deducted from that. But again, that is based on what we were able to secure through our sur early survey. Okay. Well, can you all, can you find out how many of those we are will retirees? we will delineate that one five one oh five into categories for you. Okay. Uh, the same thing. What about these administrative and non classroom positions? Uh, that would be across the board in everything from um, central office um, positions that are currently vacant as well as some that we would have to uh, redefine um, job responsibilities. So they're all vacancies is what you're saying? No, they're not all vacancies. There is a mixture on both sides, okay. on all of these guys. <coughs> we could break that down as well. That sure. would be helpful. Mr. Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. a question, maybe in line with your question about the Bill Burks's vacancy, it might be helpful to see as the budget being developed what vacancy and turnover factors were used in terms of the preparation of the budget. How many, was that 100% funded for all position? Was there some assumption in your budget for some sort of turnover or vacancy factor so that we might have a feel for the budget that was introduced, whether that was a fully funded budget or was there an assumption about historical turnover and vacancies in conjunction with your questions on these specifics. That's why he was Secretary of Finance. Okay. Uh, custodians. Sorry. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm sorry. <coughs> custodians? Um, that would be a reduction across the board in all of our uh, schools um, of 49 positions. Um, and again, with that 105, um, we would have to do a one-to-one -one match on that. So we will, when we break out that 105, we'll be able to show you all of it. 50% reduction in And same mm -hmm. thing for security? Same thing, yes, sir. All right, uh, elementary foreign language program? Um, that equates to a um, reduction of uh, a program that um, has been pretty significant in our elementary schools, and this would be the full-time uh, equivalents that are de designated for that program, as well as some of the part-time uh, equivalents that are designated for that program. We offer, we offer foreign language in all of our elementary schools. We have two schools that have an immersion program in the early grades. Uh, contract links, what can you explain with that? Um, right now we have nine and a half, 10, 11 and 12 month contracts. And we would be uh, looking at changing the contracts of our assistant principals who are now 11 month to 10 months, guidance counselors and librarians from, uh, some of them are on 10 months, some are on 11 month to nine and a half month contracts. So how does that, can you explain how that impacts on the delivery of services? Um, it, the, right now the guidance counselors who are in place are uh, sequentially uh, take vacation during the summer such that the offices would be occupied when parents and when um, students come in for enrollment. This would uh, mean that everybody would be uh, vacating the, uh, the school, at, school office at that point. Um, guidance counselors also come back earlier than uh, the teaching staff in order to provide those particular services that are needed early in the year. Um, our media specialists or librarians are uh, there to close out the media uh, center, make sure all of their reports are in on time. Uh, that would be impacted. Um, we would have to hire for summer school someone to take those positions, so we would have to make sure that 
um, that those positions are included in our summer school budget because we have to have a media specialist and a guidance counselor for summer school. Uh, APs on the uh, elementary level uh, for a period of time during the school year, there would not be an AP, but the principal will have to take on the responsibilities <coughs> during that vacated time. Um, in the high school level, the uh, APs are, um, one is a 12-month AP and the other uh, would be not there at the time. So in order to give vacations, there would have to be some kind of staggered process in schools as well. Uh, reduction in forces of position. That's the overall um, number of positions uh, based on what we would, ne we would need in essence to uh, fill that, that budget gap and it's estimated on 100 positions and that will be across the board. Um, average salary about $40,000. Okay, and you can break that down into how many actually are unfilled positions and how many are real people or are you talking all these are real people? These are real people. These are real people. This is just over and above all the others on this list, all the other cuts and positions on this list. These are real people. Uh, yes. Is there any other place that's not clear on here where a slip into the standard of benchmark results in a loss of dollars? You mentioned the five million this issue with the K3 standard. Anywhere else where there's been a slip which um, on the instructional aid side uh, for preschool, uh, that goes right along with the um, a similar slippage in that we would not be able to provide the instructional aids for preschool classrooms uh, across the board, um, which would be um, uh, a, bur a burden on our teaching staff um, dealing with the preschool students. Uh, we did not... Um, look at all of the uh, at the positions for special education because those are federally mandated but these are all general ed numbers so that would uh, impact us Mr. Chairman just a question follow yes, up BK's question uh, are those the only two places under the personnel adjustments in which the, rec the potential recommendation or adjustment to meet the, the budget shortfall would specifically eliminate a program or reduce it to the point where you would lose the state or federal monies? No. Um, the elementary foreign language program will be eliminated. Okay. Uh, what I'm looking for uh, uh, is, is, is sort of the, the reduction versus elimination mm -hmm. sort of scenario. So first off, the, the ones that would be eliminated would be elementary. Elementary um, foreign language would be eliminated. The um, um, what some of the reading programs on the elementary side, if we uh, push that number, we, the uh, Title I, um, pro not the Title I program itself, but some of those programs would have to be um, increased on the Title I side, but decreased on the general ed side, if the Title I um, side could could help. But we may uh, lose the small reading groups that we have and some of the um, reading programs that require students to go through flexible grouping. Uh, some of the tiered intervention programs may be eliminated as well. Okay, question. Past three to five years, what is the population of this student count? How, how is that treated? And, and, and also, how has um, the impact of school consolidation affected the school system in the past few years? Has it been net positive from a dollar standpoint? And if so, are there any other opportunities potentially down the road to consolidate schools? Okay, our um, budget is based on our average daily membership, which is a bit different than the head count. So, uh, in the last uh, five years, we have shown a decline in ADM. Uh, we had an uptick uh, last year on our headcount, but we've shown a decline in, in the ADM. And I believe we did, um, thank you. Um, 
Last year we uh, declined at uh, 0.17. The year prior was 0.26. The year prior was 1. So even though we're declining, our decline, decline has lessened. Um, we also, uh, you asked a question about um, what has occurred with our spending. Our, our dollar value has gone down as well. The amount appropriated to our school has gone down. Um, our schools has gone down as a result of ADM. But we did a little bit of uh, of a study, and whereas our ADM had gone down by um, that per those percentages, our um, spending had gone down by five. 5.5%. So our per pupil costs are decreasing as well, uh, but um, at a, a greater rate than what our ADM is decreasing. And also, if I may add, excuse me, if I may add, um, we can also provide you a list of building closures that we have done that over the years question. from the previous school board and the current school board, if that would, you know, be helpful yeah. in this process. Okay. And, and it, ahead, as far as consolidation of buildings, um, when we close a building, we do uh, gain um, some efficiencies with administrative costs <coughs> and uh, <coughs> operating costs on the utility side. Uh, we have not, um, the kids have to go somewhere, so the teaching population generally follows the, the children. Uh, but transportation also is a factor in that it may uh, tick up because of the distance that we now have to travel uh, when we consolidate schools. Question. Dr. Green, for this budget, <coughs> have you increased your FTEs at all? Um, our FTEs increased over a period of time um, mm -hmm. in the last five years because we added more special education teachers. Uh, we added uh, 33 in one year and 23 in another year, and we also added additional uh, instructional assistance according to that. But we have declined on some of our general ed um, areas. Uh, we also increased due to Patrick Henry coming on board. Um, you'll see that in the uptick of our general ed population. Um, um, no, I don't think it's 22. I think we had 12 positions. Five more for this year. And one last question. Um, on the personnel adjustment reduction, so we're adding 138 plus 80 plus 49 plus, is that correct? Yes. Plus 100. Okay, so this total comes to about almost 400. Almost 390. Mm -hmm. Thank oh. you. Back on the class size increase of the second bullet. Um, going to save two million six fifty six, but then turn around and lose five million in state money. That's the net. That's the net. That's the net mm -hmm. after losing the five million. Uh -huh. Okay. That's the net. Okay. Uh, let me just point out one other thing here because we also want to go on to the benefit adjustments. I think were made as part of your proposal. Mm -hmm. uh, later in the meeting, we're going to be discussing future meetings, and part of that is going to be basically drilling down on some of these expenditure areas because we're responding now to the things that you put forth that you said you might have to do. In order for us to really understand that and comprehend that, we need to look at overall different categories to see whether or not uh, there was some drilling down done in those categories uh, to get us to that position. So uh, a lot of these are, are just startup questions at this point. So we're going to be going back and basically looking behind this and look at where other decisions were made because uh, I think as Ron alluded to earlier, there were certain things that sort of went into your assumption to get you to this point and then you're saying this is what you now have to do. So uh, I just want to put this all in context, as, as, especially as we add up the numbers. Can you walk us through now the benefit adjustments that you proposed uh, starting with health insurance? Uh, sure. Uh, right now um, we pay for uh, the district pays for individual single e employees, and we pay for a single plus one and then family benefits. What this uh, indicator, uh, this amount, $3.8 billion, is that if we pay everything, everybody gets that single 
share. That's what the savings would be. That we would not have a flexible plan based on adding one person or adding the uh, family benefit. That's what that 3.8 represents. We also, uh, <coughs> as a part of our retirement program, uh, we pay the contribution for our retirees until they're 65 and can go on Medicaid D. So that's what the second 2.7 million amounts to for those who are still in retirement. Could, could I back up on the first one and then a question on the second one? Mm -hmm. Just on the benefit side of things. Um, how does that, in, in not today necessarily, but maybe for a drill down later, I'm really interested in, in how the city uh, school or how the school board system pays its benefit structure as, let's say, compared to the city employees, as compared to other counties surrounding it. It's, it's obviously a, a, an attraction retention issue. It's a benefit issue. It's a lot of different things. But I'd be interested more specifically of whether this plan is, is more comparable robust. more or less than others. Same thing relative to <coughs> as we go through the in terms of health insurance for sure. retirees and whether, secondly, whether you have a contractual obligation of some sort for those individuals that have retired and the promises were made, you know, prior to retirement relative to that. Sure. So uh, I'm also interested in whether these things can really happen or whether they're things that may or may not be able to happen relative to what we've done. That's It's sort of like promising a retirement benefit and then not paying it. Um, there's a point at which you can do that. There's a point at which you can't do that, too. Right. Um, we'll get you that information. That'd be perfect. Uh, we yes, have. No, no, that's, that's right on point. In fact, it sort of sets up what I said earlier. And you can see from the questions we're asking, when we get to these individual areas, these are the kinds of things we're going to want to know. Absolutely. So we're kind of giving you a heads up as to the kind of information that would help us be able to make some intelligent decisions on, uh, on how to proceed as we go forward. Mr. Chairman, if I could add also, at the second meeting, we were discussing having Byron Marshall, the city's CAO, and Dr. Brandon talk about the ways the city work together in consolidations, but also it would be a good time to describe the city versus school boards or um, benefit structure. Well, I can tell you right now that uh, this health insurance uh, is a, a means uh, as a result of our joining with the city, we consolidated uh, our health programs and uh, went to one uh, provider, single provider. And we have um, looked at this with respect to the city's benefit package and our benefit package, okay. so Perfect. we do have that. Um, we have some information regarding what the surrounding counties are doing because we wanted to make sure that uh, we were looking at our employment marketability. And so we do have some of that. Now the next item is the dental um, insurance. Uh, we pay a portion the, of the dental insurance for our employees. Uh, the city uh, does not pay the dental insurance for uh, its employees. So that is already uh, in a document that we can share with you. It, it would be helpful through that process as you drill down, as we come back, to talk about the ones that are covered under the city's retirement system versus those that are covered under the state retirement system because you have groups of employees that are in one system versus the other in terms of the benefit structure? Well, most, uh, the majority of our uh, employees are in the uh, state. State, the teacher. Uh, we have a, a few that uh, right. were left into the city retirement as right. a result of when we were in that retirement, but the majority of our employees are in the state retirement system. Yes, sir. Are, um, <coughs> me, is each employee given a credit on the uh, on the benefit package? I mean, I've seen that work where you've got personnel, and and uh, that would if I don't take advantage of a health insurance benefit that my employer might add, I'm not penalized for that, or I can <coughs> apply that credit toward other uh, benefit dollars. We don't operate it that way at all. Okay. So. Employee would, I guess, would get more of a benefit if they had a family on here mm -hmm. versus a single individual. Right. Okay. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Did you uh, the VRS? Did you? Um, this is the VRS um, 
Uh, in fact, in where the new employees, all new hires as of July 1, would pay the 5%. Uh, and we're not anticipating a lot of new hires, but we would pass it on to uh, the employees at 62.5. And that's um, based on a, uh, a smaller number than previously shared, as well as based on the information we gathered from our uh, employees regarding their intent to retire. So that, I think that completes the list of recommendations you made to address the $24 million. Now on the uh, next page, there are a couple of others. Oh, okay. um, we participate in regional uh, programs such as the Mass Science Center, the Governor's School. Um, those are re reflected in that uh, reduction at 5%. Um, and some other external programs that we have. Uh, we are looking at reducing the general fund support for summer school and reducing our staff development dollars by um, $116,000. And that's what brings us up to the total 23.8. Now, with the regional local program, uh, mm -hmm. does that mean you won't participate in them or that your level We're, of support goes down? Level of support will go down. Um, that includes our Minds in Motion, CIS, all kinds of external programs that we have that are regional programs. So what, 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 what's the impact of that? In other words, what does that mean? Does that the mean imp you can't send 20 students as opposed to 25 or just what, what does that mean? It could, uh, if the, the regional programs cannot absorb the reduction in their budget uh, deliberations, uh, then it could mean that we'd have to reduce the number of slots that we have for the, um, the school. Uh, just add, I sit on the board of the Math Science Center, and so reductions at the Math Science Center <coughs> would have an impact on the programs that they offer as so all of the school districts are considering uh, reductions to their program. Uh, I think you probably have seen in the newspaper that Henrico is considering uh, withdrawing from the program because of their budget situation. Um, that uh, is a two-year horizon for we uh, would have to make decisions now about our commitment to the Math Science Center at a level for it to continue to operate uh, into the future. Same is true for our relationship with the governor's schools, Appomattox and Maggie Walker. Um, each of those programs have a horizon as well as um, the difficulty of being able to sustain it if we all afford it. Can we, um, <coughs> just an idea of, of, you know, we're talking 10 regional local programs. Is there a hit at the elementary more significant than the middle school, for example, you know, math and sciences mm -hmm. across the board? Mm -hmm. and, you know what I mean? <coughs> and, um, the the actual. Are you talking system wide? Excuse me. System, system wide. Uh, professional development and for the regional schools um, the math science center as you um, stated provides instruction across the board K through 12 that will be an impact the um, minds and motions would be elementary school mostly um, well all of our elementary schools that participate uh, CIS programs impact all of our schools K through 12 uh, but not um, we don't have a CIS person at every uh, secondary school, uh, and they would have to work within their budget. Um, the governor's school are mostly secondary governor schools, and um, I guess the the last of the of the grouping would be the governor's school and secondary. Mm -hmm. What about the staff development? How does that translate? Out? What does that impact? That impacts all of our professional development across the board, our teachers mainly, um, because right now our, uh, the bulk of the money uh, goes toward the uh, teacher's professional de development. We tend to do a lot with our administrative de uh, professional development in-house through our principal's meetings, uh, but these, that staff development would impact everyone. 
but in, in what way? I'm, I'm trying, and I'm not trying to be negative about the program. I just want to understand. In other words, it would reduce what, what is it, what is it you would do if you had this under the city, if you didn't have this? Some of our continuing air programs would be impacted. Um, we offer the uh, ability for our uh, teachers to take. Uh, courses in RPS University to get the uh, necessary credits for uh, recertification. Uh, those would be impacted, allowing our uh, teachers to uh, engage in uh, small learning communities within the region may be impacted. We participate in some regional uh, professional development. So those would, uh, right off the top of my head, would be a part of that list. I'd, I'd like to see, as you said, some specifics on these because that, that's certainly one area that I have a particular interest in staff development. That's very sure. important. Because uh, I actually, uh, at one point, did a study of the Chicago school system staff professional development entire program and how you could make adjustments and things of that nature. So that's why I was right. curious about what they're doing. We're, we're currently using um, an online product. Uh, to th when we went to uh, a budget cut in professional development, we went to a online product at that point, um, where we uh, pay a license fee for uh, this product for our teachers to be able to utilize professional development in their schools. So it cuts down on having to uh, leave school and in, in the number of days that we are um, have release time for professional development. Um, but additionally, uh, we do things like bullying prevention where we uh, have online uh, processes as well as face-to-face. Uh, -face. Uh, some of our security uh, measures are pro uh, produced through our professional development for our teachers and our schools. So we can get you an overall list of what we do with what we have and then uh, you'll see the impact of that hundred and sixteen thousand dollars. Very good. One, th one thing that's impacted severely when you cut the top off of funds like this are things that make elementary school teachers sharper science teachers, sharper math teachers, uh, and exposed to the, the current <coughs> exciting things about being a math teacher or being engaged in it as a student, uh, supporting students to participate in science fairs and getting them up to speed on those kind of things. Those are the kind of the first to goes uh, out of this area. And so they're, they're really precious uh, items that, you know, nice. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just wondering on that summer school general fund support, what are they? That means that we would uh, reduce our, we, we pay for summer school through uh, both, well, really all three uh, areas, uh, general fund, local support, some state support, and some federal support. This would be from the general fund support. That doesn't mean that we would not have summer school. We probably, we have to have summer school, not probably. We have to have summer school. But we would uh, have to utilize uh, some factors to reduce the uh, intensity of our summer programs. Some students would not participate. Right. Some students would not be able to participate. And also to add what Mr. Henderson said with regards to the staff de development, that has been an area that we have already cut over, um, the, you know, last few years. So, again, that is the, the support for our teachers. Um, is there a per pupil allocation for staff development? <coughs> not no. anymore. It used to be? It used to be, not anymore. Uh, let me move on. I think there's one other page of proposed uh, recommendations. It has to do with alternatives to reduction in force. Could you kind of walk us through that a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. 2% uh, pay decrease. Yes, that would be across the board. Uh, this was to um, give a sense of what that would equate to with respect to the positions. So a 2% across the board, and that's everyone is $3.6 million. That equates to about 90 positions at $40,000, average $40,000 per position. And the same is um, um, true for the next bullet, which would be the health insurance increase. Pass that on to the employees. That equates to $2.3 million, and that's about 59 positions. I guess to the extent you can help us, how much of an 
increase with that be for employee going to, how does that translate out as to how much money we're talking about per employee? That we have be? that on the sheet. I don't have it um, uh, with us, but we have it on the sheet as far as how much we pay right now and what that reduction would look like. Yes, sir. Question for our student representative from the Education Association. Um, which alternative? I know it's you know fire or, or the frying pan, but which alternative would the teachers, um, given the choice, which are two horrible choices that choose from, <coughs> which impact would be more negative? Losing positions or increasing pay? Net increase in pay because you have to pay for health care costs. In this proposal, Okay. No. Uh, okay, why don't you go ahead and ask it now, because okay. I was more of a contextual question. Okay. Um, with the pass, there's no increase to employees. That's in addition to um, pay the employee only rate? Yes. So that would be increase there and another increase on top of the first one. Yes. Now, understanding that our um, estimated uh, increase in health care was at one point um, as high as 24 percent with changes in the benefit package and uh, things that we've uh, been able to look at, we brought it down to the 10 percent that was in this budget. So it was higher than that. We're uh, particularly sensitive to this area because <coughs> we know that our employees will suck up and take it today mm -hmm. when they sit down around their dinner table in coming years uh, as their qualifications increase as their capability and experience uh, increase uh, and we have de uh, detrimentally <coughs> affected the competitiveness of our district compared to Chesterfield and Rico we will have uh, farewell parties for those people. Yes, we will. And we will make it increasingly difficult to bring the kind of passion <coughs> into our school system that we need. Um, we are we are a fairly hard detention uh, zone, and uh, we realize that, and we can't solve that with money, uh, but we can't put a ball and chain around people's ankles and expect them to run the race. So we're very, very sensitive. I understand, and uh, once again, on a contextual basis, and to kind of set the framework for where we're going, uh, we're asking obviously tough questions about sure. what you propose to reduce. Absolutely. Uh, in order for us to do our job, because I, I think a number of us, especially I know some of the cabinet secretaries, have been through this, where we get proposals as to things that people want, want to do for a budget. And you need to look not only at those things, but to, as I said, drill down to see uh, upon which that is based, to see if there's some other yes. areas <coughs> there, so you don't have to get to perhaps. And, and we look and we look forward to yes, digging into areas that yeah. you haven't <coughs> mentioned yet that, that you guys are thinking about that we haven't thought about. Yeah, I mean, I want exactly. you to tell me something that we haven't thought about. Now that because I just want to put that in context because I realize. Uh, some of these are obviously very dramatic. You're talking about people losing jobs and losing pay and that sort of thing. But we have to put it in context and maybe some other steps we can take to address reductions uh, that don't involve these. And that's why these follow-up sessions we have where we will pick specific areas and start to drill down become very important to the extent you can give us some information on we'll that give it all, we'll as give quick it all. as you can, as quickly as you can, would be very helpful. It's also in the context of segueing into what Suzette is going to talk about, and that is looking at the efficiency study that has been done on the school system mm -hmm. to see what progress has been made as far as savings sure. that were identified there, yes. where do we stand now, stand are there other areas? That as well. right. Yeah, so uh, we're going to be hearing that, and then as Suzette also mentioned, we're going to be looking at things that can be done perhaps in conjunction <coughs> with the city that might be some savings. Okay. Also, uh, Ron's point I think is very important. 
also putting it in the context of how does this stack up against what other people are doing. So we're not just looking at this in a vacuum, but how does this stack up with what others right. are doing. So, Mr. 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 Chairman, before yeah. we continue on Suzette's piece, I, I might want to back up on the budget development process. We, okay. There's a number of folks around the table that have been, uh, have been involved in budget reduction mm -hmm. plans, whether that's at the state level, local level, or with their own companies or whatever the case may be. One of the things that uh, uh, we generally start with is start the budget from the bottom up mm -hmm. and work, work up. And, and the first level is what is absolutely required by law to do? What are those things that I cannot do or that I cannot give up? That, you know, it's, it's sort of like as, as, as Jim knows, we would go through a series under the under a, a prior governor's term where we would go back and do base budget scenarios and basically once you went through the process of determining what you had to do by law, what was required, it generally left a smaller amount of money to work with, whether that's whether you take police off the street, whether you, 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 you move guards off of prisons, whatever the case may be, there's certain things you, you can and can't do. I, I guess as, you, as we come back in a, in a future meeting, I would be interested in, in a few minutes explanation, again, today is not the time because uh, this is a, an interesting request. I'm interested in your budget during your budget development process, whether you have a base budget analysis that shows not what you, you, you feel is important to do. And, and I, I know, mm -hmm. Mr. Henderson, you've talked about some, some wonderful, wonderful things that the school system has done. <coughs> but back up to what do we have to do by law. What, mm -hmm. are the, what are the, the standards? SOQs. Yeah. The right. SOQs, SO basically. Where right. do we go back yes. to those? What are we What are we doing relative to state funding and federal funding? Mm -hmm. These are requirements. And then from that point, move up to where the budget is today. I'm just interested in, in what that amount of room is and what are we working from? Because I can talk all day about, you know, changing this scenario, this staffing level, <coughs> this benefit structure. Uh, this school, this consolidation, but if you can't do it, we're just spinning exactly. our wheels talking exactly. about things that don't make sense. So from an efficiency standpoint, from my standpoint, I would be interested in that base budget analysis of what are the absolute requirements. Okay. And then we build from that. I mean, that's what makes the school system as good as it is, is building on top of some of the basic requirements. That's what gives us a character. That's what gives it, you know, the success levels that, that you have seen in, in, in recent years. It's the yeah. things you're doing. Yeah, in discussion with other districts, um, this is a very uh, relevant point. Mm -hmm. As we look at other districts and the state SOQ, mm -hmm. uh, we see that there's 150 to 200 percent higher level of funding uh, than the SOQ calls for. And it almost says the SOQ is no longer valid. You know, and right. so there's, this, there's another question of what is a valid <coughs> measure of base budget. Right. And well, so that, then that, th that won't help me today. I understand. That right. will help long term. I, I agree with that. And so what I'm interested in is sort of the, the, the first, we're triaging what we're doing yeah. here relative yeah. to the short term and long term. And I, I you know, I, I think that's a perfectly wonderful yeah. discussion topic. Yeah. As so we, go we, we, we look at it that way with, with yeah. that. Your point is, is, is well taken. And I think it, it might help us here because we've been throwing around some state jargon here. Right. Not everybody will understand. Um, I just like the standards, standards of quality. Of quality. I'm sorry. Suzette, yes. why don't you give a, a quick statement Chairman. so people understand exactly what we're yeah. talking about. And I think we all would come to the agreement that was just a statement was made is that it's not high enough, to be perfectly yes. honest. But before um, we move to Ms. Denslow's um, presentation. Oh, it's not her presentation. She just well, talked about the right. quality. I'm so, okay, I'm sorry. But before you um, talk about the standards <laughs> of quality, um, I appreciate your statement. And I think what would be helpful in that exercise as well to give you information of cuts that we have done, the district, that we've done since 2008. I think that would also be helpful as you all, you know, go through this process in looking at things. Um, can we, you know, eliminate this? You know, where are we, you know, in comparison to the standards of quality. And also, I want to introduce Ms. Angela Anderson. Again, she is the point of contact from the administration, and she's our chief financial reporting officer. Thank you. 
Yeah. SOQ. SOQ. Um, SOQ is probably the most fundamental and important term in education. It's standards of quality, mm -hmm. and it's important because it's referred to in the state constitution as what the school divisions and the local governments have to do in education. So it's, it's the baseline the state requires for all school divisions of what program, minimal program, they have to do. The reason it's important for the funding process is it also dictates how much money the local governments have to put in and how much the state has to put in. Then as um, Dr. Brandon was alluding to, all, all localities in the state exceed that minimal amount in terms of funding as well as, I believe, as well as the program itself. Yes. So I, I'll, I'll be in the ballpark, I think, I know it's in this document. But Richmond is required to put in, I believe, $75 million, $76 million in right. the upcoming budget for schools, and already the baseline is $125 million. So that's, that's kind of reflective of what a lot of local governments do to exceed that program. So when Dr. Brandon says this is a program, or I, actually Mr. Henderson, this is a program that all local governments are exceeding, I think that's a fair statement. Mm -hmm. The program, uh, the SOQ program the state requires is a minimal level. Of and, and we also have to take into consideration the unfunded mandates that we have mm -hmm. to do that are not a part of that uh, state allocation. And that's when the local government has to pick up that uh, amount. So uh, I think the conversation that we will have uh, subsequent to this meeting will include both minimum SOQs mm -hmm. as well as those unfunded mandates that are part of this uh, process. Very good. Mr. Chairman? I have one more question. Yes, sir. If I may, um, Dr. Brandon, back on one of your charts, this is on the, on the one-time funding. Uh-huh. The one-time funding revenues that you no longer have available to you. And I guess my question now, later, um, knowing last year that these revenues would not be available in the current year, what strategies did, did we the deploy? administration or the board consider to address the fact that those were one-time funds? Well, we uh, initiated a strategic uh, hiring process that is hiring only those mission critical uh, positions, mm -hmm. understanding that 85, uh, almost 85 percent of our budget is in people. So we went through that. We went through um, reducing the amount of spending, buying only those things that are mission critical as well. Uh, our equipment budget, for instance, has been reduced down to a mere fraction. Uh, we um, also tightened our, our belts in uh, looking at things that impacted the schools, field trips, for instance. Um, some of the additional uh, dollars that were going for uh, different programs. We cut back on anything that was not a part of the regular school day. We reduced our activity amount. We reduced our BHSL amount. We knew that this was coming. We spread that money out over a two-year period. We did not use it the first year that we got the federal stimulus dollars because we put in some cost savings and, and uh, cost uh, measures in order that we could push that money back into this year. Uh, we also uh, utilized um, some projections on some of our, our um, use of uh, uh, copying things, I mean co copying equipment, something as small as that, so that we can start peeling back and reducing <coughs> our spending as much as we could without having to impact the classrooms so severely. Uh, remembering our food service program, we are uh, self-sufficient there. So we increase the, the amount that our, our food services uh, program turned over so that we don't have to utilize <coughs> our general funds uh, to support that. So those were a number of measures that we utilized. Now we did not know, however, about the VRS and the increase in VRS. That's the biggest impact on our budget. We probably could have done uh, some additional, um, uh, or we could have met that $8 million uh, shortfall without having the impact of the VRS and the VRS group life insurance. One thing uh, that as the president uh, pushed 
for this money to come to cities. Uh, it was purposed to keep teachers in classrooms. Exactly. And so the ability to use it in some other one-time strategic way for one-time purchases was not there. It was generally to retain teachers in the critical role mm -hmm. in, in the classroom. And so you either make a decision to keep the teacher where you really need them or just idly waste the money. Um, and the uh, intention was that you keep this teacher here now so that another bandage can be developed next year. And you know we stand here now without a bandage. Um, uh, do we have any other questions on the? On I this? have just one other thing to yes, add to uh, the rebenchmarking and the new composite index. Uh, we um, felt would help us as well. However, it did not get us back from where the whole harmless clause was applied. So that was also a part of our discussion. But if I could do you mind if I help <laughs> with um, the rebenchmarking is every other year, the year the state recalculates mm -hmm. the cost of providing the standards of quality. So it's called rebenchmarking. So at the statewide level, it's like $800 million worth of changes. It's, it's, it's a big deal. It's huge. Year. The composite index is the measure that determines the percentage the local governments pay versus the state pays. For Richmond, Richmond pays just a, well, just under 48% of the standards of quality budget. So it's a relatively high rate of share compared to the local, local governments. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, two questions about the personnel uh, cuts in the, uh, in the proposal. Uh, the custodians are on <coughs> positions. What is that? Is it a percentage or can you give us an idea of how many total it's about a 50 percent. That's we had two in yes. each school. It is the lowest paid custodian at every school. It's the so lowest. About mm -hmm. Okay, just doing some. Uh, let me ask you, as a policy, does the, does the uh, school uh, system have a livable wage as a policy? Living wage. The city has adopted that, which I believe is somewhere uh, in the neighborhood. We adopted the living wage perhaps uh, maybe four or five years ago. Okay. So uh, we're in compliance with that. All right. And then 13 security positions are, are these direct employees or they are uh, RPD staff? No, they're not RPD staff. No, these are, RPD no, staff. These are all our uh, staff members. They're not RPD staff. Okay. Thank you. And this would be as a percentage of the whole or, or of all of your security positions, this elimination of half of them? Is this? Okay. Thank you. Uh, unless there's some other questions on the specifics of what was proposed for the reduction, I'm going to ask Suzette to talk a little bit about the uh, efficiency study, and then we're going to have a few minutes discussion about where do we go from here. Um, I think everybody now has a copy of the efficiency study. And to put it into context, <coughs> the first thing you would notice is the date of it is August 2004. Um, Governor, then Governor Warner was doing an initiative called Education for a Lifetime. Voluntary school efficiency reviews was one of the programs that he did. And Richmond was one of the school divisions that first volunteered to have the efficiency review done. So <coughs> you have it here um, for your, in your packet is it's, it's out of date, but it provides a baseline and maybe a methodology as to how to move forward. The, the, probably the most important thing in it is it compares Richmond Public Schools not with the surrounding counties, with, which may be an unfair comparison because of demographics, but it compares Richmond with nine other city school divisions that are similar to Richmond. They're not perfect matches, because there's not a perfect match in the state, but they're similar. It's Norfolk, Newport News, Portsmouth, Hampton, uh, Roanoke, uh, Portsmouth, Petersburg, Danville, Lynchburg. So it, it gives a context to comparing Richmond spending with similar school divisions. 
Um, and I, I'll just flip through a couple of pages. I'm obviously not going to review the whole document. It might be better um, to use when we get into some of the next meetings and some drilling down. But uh, if you look with me on page, um, the little two in the executive summary, the Roman two, it describes that some basic data about Richmond City Schools, and I think some of this has changed also, um, <coughs> but it talks about how some of the direct comparisons should be done with other jurisdictions with similar population density, average school membership, percentage of children on free, the free lunch program, which is a measure of poverty, as well as the composite index, which determines the wealth of the jurisdiction and funding. <coughs> if you look at the little IV, the first chart was a list of an overview of the recommendations the state came up with, and these were analysts from the State Department of Planning and Budget, of some ways that the school system could save money. And according to the state website, about 85% of these have been done. So that, that was theirs, and I'm sure the schools can give more information about how these were implemented. But things like eliminating high bus driver overtime, purchasing fuel directly from suppliers and not from the city, um, use of software, paying bills on times, things like that that are obvious. And then if you look at the next page, Roman 5, it also talks about, they didn't quantify, but they said it would be good for the school system to combine efforts with other school divisions for purchasing and other things. Other school divisions are also buying school buses and buying some supplies that are common, so that's obvious. And then in the facing page, Romans 6, they talk about several things that were very good the school system were do was doing. So it's a, it's a balanced look. I don't know how the school divisions division would have viewed it at the time, but they did commend the school division on teacher recruitment strategies, on some IT solutions, on doing their own comprehensive annual financial report and things of that nature. Um, the, the one basic overview I'd like to point to is on page 10. This is real 10, not Roman 10. So on page 10, there's a table that compared at the time Richmond to its clusters. Everybody? We got that. So if you look down at what it was trying to do is in different categories to compare how Richmond is spending <coughs> money compared to other uh, local governments in administration, attendance and health, instruction, debt service, and other areas. So as you can see, with one being the lowest, the tenth of ten meant the school system was spending the highest of the ten jurisdictions, and one would have been the lowest. So it, in several of the areas, the school division in 2004 was the tenth, was the highest spender compared to the other jurisdictions in its cluster. Um, at the same time, it was the highest in terms of the per pupil funding from the local government, got the least amount of money per pupil from the state, and it was next to highest on federal money. <coughs> a couple of the areas, well, I'm going to hand out. I've done a quick, this is a quick and dirty, using the same data source. Um, I'm going to hand out how Richmond compares, and I'd like to have the school division mm -hmm. after this meeting go back and make sure they would confirm these numbers. They're from the state superintendent's annual report. Okay. But again, just as a, a baseline overview of how Richmond today, Richmond Public Schools, would compare mm -hmm. to where they were <coughs> in 2004, in a couple of areas, according to this chart, in this chart, in a couple of areas, they appear to have made good progress. For example, in administration, instead of ranking tenth of ten, they, they seem to be at about second of ten, meaning second lowest. And also, in the area of transportation, it looks like they're now fourth of ten rather than tenth of ten. Mm -hmm. In the other areas, still some of the highest spending. Now, at the bottom, I'll say this about the revenue streams. I could not match up 
the revenues that were calculated in the original report. So I generated it in a new way, but the same data source compares all the other left governments the same way. Shows roughly, uh, well, shows some of the same. The local government still highest, highest revenue stream, state still lowest. Uh, the state sales tax, it's debatable whether it's considered state or local, so I held it out separately. But that dedication also the highest, as was federal. So the total revenue stream is still the highest per capita, per pupil of the 10 uh, members of the cluster. Is everybody? So the rest of the report breaks down by the classifications, some recommendations, as well as dictating some areas that would be useful to look at. And my suggestion is that as we go through and say look at transportation spending in future meetings and if there are still areas that can be looked at or administration or attendance and health, that that would be the time we might use this as a baseline document and um, go through it in more detail. Jim, does that make sense? And at, with that, I think, those, that's that's basically the overview of what I want to put in context. Thank you. Any questions, Susanna? Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's talk about what do we do next. And I think each of you have in front of you a, uh, a one page that has a suggested schedule as far as the kind of meeting we want to have. Oh, it's handing it out there. Oh, okay. overview today. Uh, the next meeting we're proposing is to have an uh, uh, overview of the prior and ongoing deficiencies between the, between the city and the school board, as well as uh, areas uh, where we would kind of focus in on areas to target for uh, uh, efficiency. And then, as you can see, there are laid out uh, several meetings where we would focus on specific <coughs> And what I'd like to suggest is if, uh, if you've got your calendars with you, to the extent we can put some dates on these now, I think that would be very helpful for everybody's schedule because I know we got really busy folks here. And so the sooner you get something on your schedule, the better. Uh, I was looking at having this second meeting uh, a week from today, which gives us some time to get some of this other information that we've talked to today, start that process uh, next Monday. Uh, which I gather is not a, a council meeting day. Uh, but I'd like to get some feedback from you as to, uh, one, if that's a good day, and then two, what's a good time of day, because starting at 8 o'clock may not be good for everybody. Uh, if you were gracious enough to do it today, I don't know if I can go back to that well too many times. So, <laughs> okay, is it 19th, does that work? Okay, well, what's a good time? For or that will get the most of you here. Nine o'clock. Perfect for me. Are you? I just out. I'm in D.C., but I I may very well be able to just dial in and listen. Yeah. Okay. So don't plan it around me. All right. So can we agree on next Monday at nine o'clock for this next second meeting? Uh, now, depending upon how how quickly you want to go, because the way this is, is set up is we would then start to focus on expenditure categories at the third meeting, and I would think. We've already identified the areas already. I was thinking about the next day, if that would work for you, maybe the afternoon of the 20th to start that first discussion. Does that work? I mean, if, like in the afternoon? Uh, what's a good time? 3 o'clock? 4 o'clock? You're out. Okay. Keep in mind that we're not going to be able to get everybody at every meeting. So, right. does the afternoon of the twentieth work? Yeah. Two okay. Say so two o'clock. Okay. Uh, the fourth meeting, which is a, or another focus on expenditure categories, I was thinking 
Monday is a, is a good day. The following Monday, which would be the 29th. 6th. 26th. I'm sorry, the 26th, I'm sorry. And what's a good time? Does the 9 o'clock work there, or does that cause a problem? 8 a.m.? 7 a.m.? You're saying 9, Jeff? Yeah. 9 o'clock on the 26th? Okay. And for the fourth <laughs> meeting, where we would focus on educational service delivery, what have you. Uh, let, me, let me throw out one other thing that's not on here. Uh, we would like to have at least one opportunity for the public to provide some input. And I was looking at April 3rd to do that, which is a Tuesday, maybe at like 4 o'clock, because I think later in the day that makes it a little more accessible to, to the public to come and share any thoughts or ideas they may have on what we're looking at. The 3rd of April? Yeah. It's so 4. At 4 o'clock? Mm -hmm. It's the general I, public. I was going to say, I appreciate that everyone is volunteering here for this, but really to have the general public input, I think we need to do it at 5 o'clock or oh, late. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. I just picked so that number out of there. 5 is fine. Possibly. Uh, <coughs> Chairman Dyke, also we have a schedule, we have a series of community meetings that will be held at our schools and so you won't have to create another meeting that's an opportunity to hear input from the parents and the community as well. Do you have a schedule for that already? Yes. The first meeting will be held at Blackwell Elementary School on the 15th at 6, 6 p.m. April? This March. month. This month. Of March. But I can give you the dates of the other meetings. We're having them at five locations throughout the city. All right, well, my, well that might be, might be easier for us in the sense of then you can pick whatever hearings you think you can attend so you can hear some public input. And then also obviously make it clear to the public if they have things they want to give directly to us, they certainly can, can do that. We'd be able okay. to receive them. Jim, is that in lieu of the April 3rd or is that in addition to? Well, we could use the April 3rd now to have our own meeting. I was, I thought we would need to set aside some specific time for us to hear from the public, but if in fact You may still want to do that. I'm. We're just offering you a... Okay, I've, what does the task force think? Would you want to have our own date or you want to piggyback on what the school board's doing? Well, okay, and then to the extent that uh, there are members there, you can acknowledge that so that the folks want to speak Okay, to them. okay. no problem. Is the purpose of your public meetings is to get public input on the budget? Yes, the budget discussion and to discuss the factors that relate to the per pupil funding, the cost of the per pupil funding, to you know, to really educate our parents and the community about the, the process and the impact. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just just a comment. The purpose of that public hearing is different mm -hmm. than the purpose of a public hearing that I thought I heard you describe, and that is outlining issues associated with the. the the, the $23.8 million issue. I think you could accomplish both, but I'm not sure that those meetings, and tell me if I'm wrong, are necessarily connected to that one issue, whereas we are very well mm -hmm. defined in terms of the issue that we're okay. attempting to deal with. I think all of them could be useful because you may gain right. some very important Our parents and community, they are aware of this $23.8 million shortfall and the recommend, recommended cuts and the impact that it will have on the district. So I think it will be um, beneficial you know, for you all to attend, okay. well, to let's, hear. Let's just go with ours on the 3rd at 5.30 or 5? 5 is fine. Okay. So is this for public input or is this just for public input? This would be for public input. Now, so, yeah, okay. uh, yeah. a part of me says you could also use that mm -hmm. to have a hearing, but I'm not sure what kind of turnout you're going to get from the public. I mean, I've uh, having sat through a few public hearings in my life. Sometimes they can be pretty lengthy, and so we may not have the opportunity to have a meeting. So I think we ought to just dedicate that to hearing from the public. If members want to attend these other meetings. Right. Oh, yeah, no, we, uh, no that's, yes. that's certain, yeah. And we'll definitely give you a, the list of, you know, the times and the dates and location. Okay. We'll send out both a list of the meeting dates you all have scheduled as well as the meeting dates. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, now that gets us to the last, the, the fifth meeting, which is a focus on expenditure categories, education, service delivery. Uh, let's see, that has to be separate from the board. Uh, yeah, did we mention the 29th? We haven't set that aside. Right. I, mean, I realize some of these may be uh, pretty close, but we do have a short time frame here, so. You're saying March 29th is Yeah, I'm looking at the 29th. Does that work for folks? For the, for the, the meeting that's listed as the fifth meeting? That's a Thursday. Whatever time works for you, just tell me what, what's good, because I, I realize that uh, we could go at 9 o'clock. Does that work? Or you was it? Okay. 29 o'clock. All right. Now the sixth one, where we talk about short-term recommendations. Uh, my inclination might be to uh, hold off on setting that until we, we see how these others are going, how much information we need, and if we can schedule a meeting based on uh, how much time we might think we need. If that's okay with you. So what I've got here is the next meeting being March 19th at 9 o'clock, the third meeting being March 20th at 2 o'clock, the fourth meeting being March 26th at 9 o'clock, the fifth meeting being March 29th at 9 o'clock. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Sorry? April 3rd. Mr. Public. Oh, the hearing. Public Sorry, the, April, the hearing is April 3rd at 5 o'clock. No date for the sixth meeting. Yeah. No date for the sixth meeting. Okay? Any other uh, observations that the task force members want to make at this point? I mean, we've heard quite a bit of information today, and I think uh, I want to commend the school system and the school board for their uh, cooperation in being here. And uh, uh, this is going to be a pretty intensive process going forward, but I think we can all agree that we all want to come out at a place where we're doing the best we can for the students. Yes. To give them the best possible opportunity to have an education that will make them competitive in the global economy. But we also have the reality of the fact that, unfortunately, unlike the federal government, we don't have a printing press here in, in Virginia that we can print money. And we've got a limited amount of money and we need to figure out how we can spend that effectively and efficiently to accomplish our goals. And that's going to mean making some tough decisions. We've heard right. some things here today that are pretty drastic. But having gone through this myself, uh, I know sometimes you just have to hunker down and make some tough decisions because you just don't have the money. And so we want to have as much information available as possible in making some recommendations to the mayor and to the council as to areas where we think that some of these decisions need to be made and, and provide whatever guidance we can. So uh, are there any other observations that anybody on the task force wants to make at this point? Madam Superintendent. Madam. All right. Um and thank you all for being here. Thank you for uh, carving out a portion of your time uh, in your, I'm sure, already busy schedules to support and help us. Uh, just one ho housekeeping detail. Um, will we be able to get copies or uh, benefit of notes that are being taken so that we can make sure that we're providing everything mm -hmm. that um, has yes. been requested? Yeah. yeah, well, David and Susanna will be our two point persons. And also, uh, for the benefit of the task force, let me uh, uh, share with you that we are also exploring whether or not there might be some other resources available to help us. Uh, we're sort of at the preliminary stages right now, uh, but we've got a lot to do in a short time period, and we want to make sure we have as many resources as possible to help uh, help the uh, task force. So uh, at our next session, we'll probably be able to talk a little bit more about that uh, and share that with you. Okay. And I just want to say thank you again. and to let you know that we are committed to, um, to working with the task force and our goal is to make sure that our students are receiving the best education possible. And we, are, we will make the tough decisions and because we have, we've made them before. So this, this is where we are and but again, know that we are committed. Appreciate Thank you. That. And we realize it's not going to be easy and that uh, everybody wants, uh, as I said, to get to the same goal. But exactly. We're going to have to do what we have to do. Any other 
comment from any task force members, any, any observations? If not, uh, we will stand adjourned until next Monday at uh, 2 o'clock. Back in the same room. 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock, I'm sorry. 9 o'clock, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> <Nine o 'clock. laughs> <Nine o 'clock. laughs>